The Life of Blessed Eusebius A reading from Father Gregory Yongoshi's The Lives of the Brothers of the Order of St. Paul the First Hermit Translated to English by Deacon Casimir Zelinsky Eusebius was born in the Hungarian city of Estegom from parents who enjoyed excellent and widespread esteem. In his years of youth, the truth attracted him. His ability to endure hunger and thirst grew so much that everyone admired that a man, with such a delicate and subtle constitution, that satisfied with such scarce food, could lead such a life, always being joyful. He kept great vigils and spent his time reciting the divine office, or in contemplation, or in study. He learned philosophy, thanks to which mortals may become pleasing to God. Thus, he wrote books without neglecting the perfect fulfilment of God's commandments, taking care of the Lord's words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who practices and teaches them, such a man will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. When due to his acknowledged merits, he was granted the dignity of a canon of Estegom, among many other glorious deeds, he wished to practice hospitality just as the patriarch Abraham once did. For this reason, he often visited the brothers living alone in the forests. They in turn came from the hermitage to his home to exchange wicker baskets for bread. Meeting them gave him so much joy that he frequently went there where God's servants went out of duty, like an industrious worker bee following sweet honey. Thus he decided to leave this world, his homeland, material things and his relatives, to serve with all humility the Lord of hosts. Blessed be the man, Eusebius, filled in a marvellous way with God's love. Not wanting to hide the bonds of charity that enveloped him, he offered his friends and acquaintances the flowers of virtue and a burning spirit of devotion. Forgetting his past riches and considering all things passing as dung, his friends decided to go and live with him to win Christ alone. In this way he made those that had tasted the sweetness of God's love, disposed to desire to follow the Lord stripped on the cross, immediately and without any remains, just as soon as the wars ended with the enemy heathen Tartars. Eusebius therefore, with his companions, postponed leaving Estegon until peace was restored. However later, with the same devotion, though not with the same age, they went to the inhabitants of the hermitage, declaring that with them they would sincerely serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They did so even though relatives and friends tried to dissuade them from doing so. Eusebius, much more firm than the others, refuted the temptations, usually responding, Listen, he said, after all, Christ chose the torment, although he loved his mother, and knew that his suffering would cause her suffering because her soul would be pierced by the sword of sorrow. He did not spare also the close and beloved John the Evangelist, burdened beyond all imagining with the fear of sorrows, because although he could come down from the cross, he did not do it, but remained there until his death. In the same way, because of you who suffer, and for us who weep, we do not want to leave the cross of repentance, but we will remain steadfast until death. Let the disgraceful confusion not tear us away from the world that is better. Hearing this, blooding with tears, crushed in heart, and touched by remorse, they could not answer the spirit that spoke through him. Surely the hermit's brothers, though seasoned in holy life, benefit greatly from him. Brother Eusebius, a man devoted to God, a magnificent lover of the desert, living with six brothers in a cave consisting of three rooms, laid the foundations of the future monastery following the monastic rule. He himself once lived in the cave, near a fountain, which flows in honour of the Holy Cross. That same cross whose power made powerless all the attempts of the ancient enemy of the human race. He himself lived rich in virtue, distinguished by piety and sanctity, though with a weak and power body. He was seasoned in all humility, taking away from his mouth and lessening, curtailing to a minimum the measure of food and drink, by which he was always healthy and beautiful. Enlightened by God's grace among the various pious duties and works, he very earnestly practised hospitality.
Renown caused by him, which made him famous, brought to him a young man named Benedict, who dedicated himself to the service of monks forever, sharing with them the same kind of holy life in the community. Another, who was named Stephen, destined to become a general of hermits in the future, also joined by his example. At that time, the pious father, rejoicing at every penitent, went to the oratory where, as he used to, thanking God in an ardent and highly repentant spirit, full of tears, begging the law, the giver of all things, to multiply the number of novices and to preserve them in their sacred commitment. Undoubtedly, thanks to his merits and prayers, they remain steadfast. In addition, many others, old and young, arrived. Then, kings and princes, and noblemen of different kingdoms, erected numerous monasteries, whose names were written around 1263. In 1262, the aforementioned Eusebius, the provincial prior, having taken several brothers with him, came to Urban IV and asked for the blessed Augustine's rule. St. Thomas Aquinas usefully came to help in the Roman Curia. Eusebius, a most prosperous and a most sincere father, who always lived in the greatest submission to the Lord God, and very zealously serving his fellow men, established numerous monasteries in Hungary. When he was about to go to eternal rest near the moment of his death, in order to shape their religious and saintly life, he gave a beautiful encouragement to all his numerous disciples, that they would love God above all else, and then our neighbour, because these are the two main commandments given to us. Moreover, that among other virtues, they keep obedience, for the kingdom of heaven is gained only by those obedient to the commandments. He then added that they ought to keep his salutary instructions as a mark of unity, and the presence of the brothers while they were praying, in beautiful old age, he fell asleep with his fathers and was buried at the Holy Cross on February 20th.